Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Oxford. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. What I want to speak with you about, I have shown to the leaders in New Delhi, the leaders in Beijing, in uh, the White House, um, and they've agreed we have a massive, current, very serious issue on our hands. Um, and as you do in the way of politicians, you might know what is right, but you're not going to act in what is right unless you can be persuaded to by the public. You know where your bread is buttered, and that is the ballot box. So I've decided to launch a global lecture series, um, and it kicks off here in Oxford. So it has a simple message. The greatest greenwash in the world is you being sold that it's the public's fault. Actually, it's not the public's fault. It is not your fault. You have every right to consume, every right to educate your kids, to go and visit grand or granddad or your girl or boyfriend in the other side of the world. That's your absolute birthright. I've had it, you deserve it. But not in a way that is going to destroy the planet. Now, you can't control that, but I can tell you who does. People like me, leaders like me, there are about a thousand of us only. A core group of about 50 who could drive it. And policy makers that enshrine where business has to go to compete with each other. The guide rules, the level playing field. Those policies are set right against going green as, as we are now. Let's just go to a touchy subject. Say, so take the Murdoch press. Globally, they swing to popular opinion. That's what good, responsible press houses do. They don't actually have a dog in the race. They don't have a fossil fuel investment structure within their group that, that they're trying to support. They will listen very strongly to social media and to public opinion. Now, they get accused of being divisive, this, that, and the other thing. Like, completely agree. However, they will be swayed by public opinion. The reason why I'm speaking with you all today is I want you to start the fire of that global public opinion. They might not be the problem. The real problem I want you to look closely at is media empires which have holdings within their ownership structure in the fossil fuel sector. Look closely at their behaviour. That vested interest behaviour where they might only have a fractional part of the value of their empire in fossil fuels, believe it or not, they're going to use the whole of their media empire to protect that small pin-headed approach to their global wealth. So I wanted us to say, look, let's not blame media, let's have us drive media. We drive media with our own public opinion, we drive media through our much more influential social media and through your own personal outreach to your colleagues around the corner and around the world. So let's start with, say, the UK. It stepped right back from its climate commitments and it's announced plans for a smoke-free generation. That's great. Responsible governments driven by science will, will drive the youth away from vaping, realising that it's a lot more lethal and way more addictive than the nicotine you get naturally in tobacco. You can just dial up the nicotine content, which is why it is such a terribly unfair game on kids. It's addictive as soon as they trial it. Now, what's a much worse game for in, in the sense of fairness is every generation which lives, not just the youth. The older generation, your generation, slightly older, slightly younger, doesn't matter. Every generation which lives, every mammal which lives, every generation which may ever live of humans on Earth. Think of that. That's way less glamorous than banning vaping for kids, but it's way more sinister and way more serious. So I'd like to just say to you, we are capable of holding governments to account and holding businesses to account. I can assure you, as a so-called captain of industry, I can't operate without a social licence. 
I can't operate without a social license. Hold people like me to account. The difference between myself providing energy and products to maintain and increase global standards of living and not polluting the, the planet, not destroying your future, is simply hard work. Don't get caught with the trillions of dollars. It all sounds, um, all sounds uh, like way too much money. Don't get caught in the fact that it's very hard to abate. Just say, actually, you're too lazy to abate it. You can actually do it. These are things which we should by now be doing. And um, if I could just take you to um, the confessions of a carbon emitter. You know, I did send myself back to school in 2016. Um, I got around, met most of my professors in bare feet um, and tried to keep, through really good leadership, um, the empire rolling and the philanthropies rolling. But really, I just recognised that I'm just a kid from the deep West Australian outback bush. I grew up around sheep and cattle and horsemanship. Um, and then I began to start a very, very large company. And I see no difference from my perspective as an impoverished kid to a so-called captain of industry and philanthropist, to you being able to accelerate your education standards across the world and across the world in the Oxford world in particular, as well as your um, standard of living while eliminating pollution. And I'll take you through that later in the lecture. I'm that person who, over the past 20 years, has built a hugely successful company. We explore for and we deliver iron ore all over the world. And I can say much of China has been built on the over 2 billion tonnes of iron ore, which my company as a startup has already shipped to that country alone. And I've done it on the back of fossil fuels. So how ironic it is that I'm here trying to turn you and the world away completely from fossil fuels taking the blame personally and saying, hold the other thousand odd people to account like I wish to be held to account by you. You know, you can have virtue signalling tech companies who aren't going to make a difference to the world carbon budget, spending a whole heap of money persuading you that they're in, in touch with Mother Nature. Please ignore that. Don't even take the time to listen or watch the ads. Look hard at Shell. Look hard at British Petroleum. Look hard at Fortescue Metals Group. Look hard at the steel companies. Look hard at the car making companies. Look hard at the aviation and shipping companies. They are the companies which control the carbon budget which is destroying your planet, which is destroying your ability to live. I'd have to say all heavy industry, intensive agriculture, transport, we are the ones responsible for global warming. Government policies, as I mentioned earlier, allow these policies to destroy your planet by aligning people like me to use diesel. We chop through billions and billions of dollars a year on diesel fuel rebates in my country, Australia, which pushes me, if I want to compete against BHP and Rio Tinto, to keep buying diesel-consuming engines, tractors, trucks, haul packs, everything, all using diesel because I get heavily subsidised to go and do it. I have no incentive at all to move away from that. That's government policy, forcing industry to follow certain tracks. And this isn't about, oh, yeah, but there's less profit in it. Can I just say, if there isn't profit, Oxford wouldn't exist. We need profit to sustain, to tax, to be able to fund, to make philanthropic donations. You cannot run a business if you cannot pay the people who work for you. They obviously have their own responsibilities, keep baby in shoes, feed the kids, etc. They're not going to do it without wages. You can't pay wages without profit. So I just want to say this isn't about captains of industry um, just wanting to hold up profits. It's about captains of industry not having enough courage to change how they make their profit. 
I had one captain of industry describe a really big one, say, hang on, hang on, you know, we're jugglers. Now you want us to go and be high jumpers on an on a athletic field. And also, if you could, you'd have us juggling and high jumping at the same time. We just can't do that. That's describing it at its most self-homework marking way. In fact, captains of industry and policymakers can change. I want to hold ourselves up as proof. It's industrialists like me who listen to scientists that know that there's a mathematical equation leading to human extinction if we keep going the way we are. It's very hard to argue with a mathematical equation. It's up to, therefore, people not just like me, but like you, to make sure that your policymakers here in Britain and your chief executives who are falling for the winding back on climate policies in your country, to know the science, to know the math. If not you, Oxford, then who? not the person on the street. You are in the <laughs> academia post-excellence here. We have a responsibility to make sure that our leaders, both corporate and government, know the facts. Then the next thing which locks in isn't guilt, because people can live with it. It's shame. You have policies which you can make. So, let me just say, there's been three months this year which have been over 1.5 degrees. So that is the tipping point. And it's accelerating. Only your last month, we're at 1.776 degrees. It's going up. It's not plattering out. It's accelerating. It's catching most scientists off guard. I don't know anyone who predicted that we'd be having this serious climactic events and acceleration, depreciation of ice in the Antarctic, all the issues we're seeing, and what they didn't take into account, team, is humidity. As we walk through the, what's happening in our environment, what we're seeing is a much greater acceleration in percentage terms multiply it, please, in humidity. And I want to work that through with you. As you sit here today, as I walk around in front of you this afternoon, I am a thermoregulated individual. It's a serious survival advantage. It enables me to do a whole heap of things which give me a really serious competitive edge over reptiles who can't efficiently thermoregulate. Where that survival advantage stops is when our atmospheric temperature rises above what I can regulate in an environment where I can no longer regulate. So you can handle, you know, a great British scientist who went on to be chair of the Royal Society, you can handle temperatures, if you can believe this, please believe it, over 120 degrees Celsius for up to 30 minutes, provided that air is dry. You add in humidity, your ability to thermoregulate, your ability for your sweat to cool you stops. This is a really serious issue here in Britain. You've got about 5% of your houses with air conditioning. If you have a heat wave here in Britain, and we're having heat waves all over the world, you just have escaped serious heat waves here, then unless you can get to air conditioning, you're in a big problem. But say you don't live in Britain, say you just want to go explore India, explore China, explore North America, that's your absolute right. You get heat waves there in high humidity, and your fancy hotel room will become your coffin. I just want to walk you through what that looks like. Um, you 
thermoregulate, but when you cannot do that, it's called in science the wet bulb effect. If you just wrap a cloth around a temperature gauge with a mercury bulb at the bottom, like you're very familiar with, um, that temperature gauge will show a marked de decrease in temperature. That's it on an individual basis. That's all it is. Take the wet cloth off, the temperature goes back up. The issue with humans is that when you put humidity into the environment, which is accelerating at 6 to 7 to 8 per cent, every one degrees warming we've had, and we're having one and a half degrees warming right now, so kick it up 10 per cent since the pre industrial age, then your body starts to break down. The tiny structures like your proteins start to unravel. And your ability to control uh, what happens next also unravels. You have seizures, you have th headaches you can't even think of, you have movement towards heat stroke, heart attack. It's incredibly painful. If you make it to hospital, they'll quite literally plug your blood into a refrigerator and pump it back into your body. You've got about a 30, 40% chance of survival on the statistics. When you take the wet bulb effect and apply it to what we must now, because we have got global warming, we don't have individual warming, we're having warming here in Britain, we're having warming in India. You apply the wet bulb effect to population scale, you now have lethal humidity. There's about three and a half billion people in the world who are exposed around that massive subtropical belt of our earth to lethal humidity. Less than 15% of them have access to air conditioning. Your only defence is access to air conditioning. And humidity isn't really bad for the fact that it switches off your ability to thermoregulate, to cool yourself, because just sitting here, right, this good-looking character, if humidity was here in this temperature right now, serious humidity, regardless of the temperature, his body would start to overheat. Your body's generating heat all the time. Temperatures of 30 to 35 degrees Sound pretty cool. Let's go down the beach. Mm -mm -mm. You put humidity in that and your body will accelerate quickly within hours. Two, three hours to 41 degrees. That's your switch off point as a human, as a mammal. That's where those tiny molecular structures cannot be unraveled. So that's one part of lethal humidity. The other part is, have you ever wondered not being climate scholars, why the floods and the droughts and the fires and everything you're seeing is looking worse and worse. I mean, is this just the media playing it up or is it actually happening? I mean, in Pakistan, we lost, sorry, in, in that part of the world, you've seen huge floods. In Libya, you've seen 11,000 people killed in floods, swept out to sea. Could that happen in London? Yeah, that could happen in London. It's, it's no longer impossible. What happens with climate is when you're surrounded by oceans, your humidity rises dramatically with heat. What you have in global warming is heat. That humidity is like the firepower in a rocket it increases the intensity level of atmospheric and climactic events dramatically. So if you're wondering how come the winds are so strong in these typhoons, how come these floods are so serious, how come we're getting these really se severe climate events, is this the media bedding it up or is it actually worse than it's ever been in human history? Yes, it's actually worse than it's ever been in human history because of humidity. And this is what I wanted to tell you if you have a one and a half degree global warming, which is upon us now, 
Think what two degrees is going to do. The difference between, say, 70 and 80 percent humidity, that 10 percent, from the rise of only one and a half percent since pre-industrial age, that's enough to make a lot of the world lethal. And the reason why Beijing New, Delhi, Beijing, New Delhi and DC are listening is because this is not a global warming issue. This is a serious internal and external sovereign threat issue. That is the only reason why I've been given any audience by those three state powers. They'd like to say, oh, we really care about the climate. They really care about the climate. What they care about most is internal security. And those three countries, India, China, North America, are the most populous and are, with dreadful irony, the most exposed to lethal humidity. So I want to just bring this back to questions and answers as soon as possible. Can you scroll down, please? Um, and, um, and say to you, it's time for us to say global warming, climate change is not a future issue, it's not a predictive issue. We have a really serious extension of this, which we're seeing in deaths in India, we've seen in deaths in China, we've seen in deaths around the world, where people are incapable of escaping, not the heat, but the humidity which kills them, because they can't get to air conditioning. This can lead to mass death events. It's just numbers, it's just maths, which will put World War II in the shade. So, I'm saying to leaders like I'm saying to you in Oxford, now is the time to move. The threat is with us right now. It's killing people as I speak. It's not a future event, it's a current event. We just don't understand how serious it is. If you say, well, what happens next? I'll say stampede behaviours, survival behaviours, when borders get crushed. And this is what I want to say to you. We are able to fix this. This is a fixable problem. Bring it back to those 1,000 people. Bring it back to that 50-person subset. Politicians are beholden to the electoral cycle. We know that. So the answer is obvious. We need to eliminate fossil fuels. We need to turn to business to do that. And there are solutions. And this is exactly what my company Fortescue is doing. Not so far from here, We've invented the world's first infinity train. It's a train which can take the 30,000 tonnes of iron ore per load down to the port, some five to 600 kilometres away, depending on which mine. And that puts enough power in the energy system, storage system of that train to send that train all the way back uphill without any external source of energy forever. Yeah, I just want to dwell on that one. Energy and life. So this is sustainable energy, not fossil fuel energy, which is energy and death. And I just want to be blunt about that. I'm just here now being a simple scientist. You know how hard it is to prove anything in science. Everything has to be peer reviewed. We have to have popular opinion. There is no popular opinion about this. It's binary, black and white. In COP28, we intend to sail the first ship into uh, Abu Dhabi, hopefully with Prime Minister Modi on the front, if we can get the licensing authorities for that. He's a huge hydrogen supporter. Um, and demonstrate that world heavy transport, world shipping, even world aviation can move a lot quicker. If you say, let's go do it by 20s, 2040s or 2050s, literally you're making it someone else's problem. You're not taking it seriously at all. And this is where universities are very much in this fight, team. It's where we all have a very serious role which we should be playing. We currently call ourselves an intelligent species, yet we're putting $7 trillion a year into our extinction in subsidies. That doesn't sound like an intelligent species. What it actually is, is an intelligent species who do not have courage to change. 
So I want to bring you back to this word, courage. I want you to have the courage to step out, put lethal humanity on the table. We're not arguing about the science. We're not arguing if it's next year or next decade or 20, 40 or 50. We're saying it's right now. It's killing people right now and we have proof. We don't need any more of your talk. It's going to kill people. It is killing people and all we don't know is how many millions of people are going to die senselessly while you lazily don't change how your company operates and how you operate. And don't say you can't do it. The mining industry is apparently the laggard of the industrial world, the slowest to move. That's not right. We're putting $6.2 billion on the table. We started three years ago. We've already saved $400 million to make ourselves fully fossil fuel free by 2030. Not 2040, not 2050, in the time era which we must. That's the time era, Oxford, which I need you to hold your politicians and your corporations too. Do not allow the 2040 or 2050 talk. Speak 2030, then you're hitting the pay packet, the bonus system, the electoral cycle of those thousand people who can stop global warming. Now, I don't think I will talk more at you, if you'd forgive me. I'd really like to talk more with you and um, say, do you have any questions? What have you found arresting or what have you found totally boring about my presentation? Um, because I'd be really delighted to discuss it with you. Dr. Andrew Forrest for your lecture here, Andrew's your special fine. lecture here today. So now I'll invite uh, also upon your sort of uh, uh, suggestion here, invite the audience to think about the questions, the challenges, the things that uh, Andrew did not share with us or that you would like Andrew to share with us further. I was thinking when I was listening to how well aligned uh, your call for action your uh, call for urgency, it is now, is very much aligned with what we at the Oxford Smith School are working on. We are researchers, but we are also concerned researchers, and we have a particular um, sort of urgency, and I sense that amongst all the researchers that I'm, I'm meeting with uh, here at the, at the Smith School, the urgency for action, actually to make that research uh, do something in our society, whether it is policy making or whether it is with our businesses or even with our NGOs that we also have educated quite a number of over the years here. So we are very aligned with your call for action. And uh, maybe I can start uh, asking, you know, maybe for you to, to talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, what the role of the university is. We know that you are a marine biologist uh, and you have your PhD in, in marine biology, so a researcher yourself. Mm. Uh, how do you see our role? What is the most important thing that we can uh, provide to the world, uh, in your opinion? Mm, okay, okay, so um, we'll start with the lady um, with the dark hair who just put your hand up. I'll just answer this question first. Um, universities do more than just research. They also set the argument and they set the standard. Um, and I'd say uh, you, you have some of the most... Um, animated, some of the most energetic, some of the most motivated opinion leaders here um, and in universities around the world, let's really trigger that into action. Um, second, um, you need to work within institutions which themselves recognise that the change is happening um, and in most cases has happened and you want your own institution, say Oxford to change Oxford, accepts millions of pounds a year from fossil fuel subsidies, funding, support, etc. How do we move away from the next tobacco of public university funding, private university funding? I put the challenge back to people like me to say, 
Yes, we recognise this is a big problem. We might have five or six million pounds of funding here in Oxford and more around the world. Let's replace that. Let's go to so-called captains of industry like me and say, can we be introduced to, can we work with, could you make the uh, persuasive introduction to ins the insurance companies who take premiums from you, to the investment banks who take fees from you, to the whole business ecosystem, which is not yet supporting universities, which very well could, particularly when you say to an insurance company or an investment bank, every dollar you put in will save us from taking a dollar from the fossil fuel sector. I think the switch of funding for universities to have anything to do with the fossil fuel sector is really important to set a, a national example. And secondly, look to people like me to replace that funding. Thank you. Thank you for that response. I think we have a question already over here and then I know Adam has a question and then down here. Please go. Um, thank you for your Could presentation. Could you please just say briefly your name and where you... Sure. Uh, my name is Viola. I'm a DPhil student at the Smith School. Um, I think one of, the, yeah, one of the biggest supply constraints to energy transition is the availability of transition metals and minerals. Given the last decade of cleaning up balance sheets and returning value to shareholders, what will it take for the large miners to start spending capex to do exploration and extraction? And is there a way to do it that, uh, in a way that's not increasingly inflationary? Is there a way to not... Just explain that again. Is there, um, what would it take for large miners to spend the capex on exploration and extraction of transition metals and minerals? And then two, is there a way to do that that is not increasingly inflationary? Yeah, it's, it's in, it, did you say inflationary at the end? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, well, let me cut straight to it. There is enough copper, lithium, iridium, cobalt in the world in the terrestrial environment right now to keep the world rolling. I don't think you should in any way look at subsea mining. Um, you could simply say we'll have subsea mining provided you do the same longitudinal evaluations for the environment down there as what you do, have to do on land to get an advanced world mining permit. And that does not have to be a turn to in order to keep critical minerals rolling. If you have a simple standard of, of uh, exploration where you don't cause harm, that is in dry environments in particular, we, for instance, have pulled out of Ecuador because we couldn't see sustainability there, um, then there is huge amounts of copper. Now, the deposits you hear about are copper, say, at 0.6 percent copper or lithium at another percent. With only a small increase in that copper price or that lithium price, <coughs> then you will see those deposits multiply. That leads to an increase in production, that leads to an increase in efficiency and keeps the commodity price from having next to no effect on the ultimate consumer price. But you need to be able to kick it off first. Thank you very much for this. Also, Adam, please introduce yourself briefly. Hey, Andrew. Uh, Adam Parr, I'm also a DPhil student at the Smith School and a former uh, colleague of yours. Um, so, Andrew, there are many people like you, the thousand, who can read the science and they're intelligent enough to do that. What do you think made you come to this realisation that this was such an important and urgent problem that you've effectively dedicated your life to it? Look, really the trigger for me was um, uh, having a, having a world-leading marine ecologist uh, speak to me about the heat waves which occur in the ocean. Um, heat waves, firestorms, etc., are terrible in the terrestrial environment. Most people can get out of the road. In the ocean, they can't. And the destruction of that is massive. And, and um, of course, at the core of that is the warming of the oceans, the deoxygenation of oceans. What really triggered me was, um, which led to that I'm scared slide, is the Russian permafrost. Um, is studying the Russian permafrost with Russian scientists and learning that, 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 if you like, frozen ocean 
two and a half times the size of Australia, wrapped around the Arctic, is beginning to let go its carbon dioxide, its methane, the rest of its organic matter. But it, as it starts to collapse, the amount of uh, global warming gases which will be released from just that one permafrost, there's at least four in the world, from just that one permafrost is responsible for the tremendous warming, the accelerated warming, three, four hundred percent quicker than the rest of the world that you're seeing in the Arctic. Um, and, uh, and so it was, it was looking at that um, cataclysmic event of global warming caused by just that permafrost letting go that made me think everything is now inconsequential to that event. Um, we should fight it for everything we have. When I started to look at how you could fight it as a business, because it all came back down to business, all the philanthropy in the world, Gates, Forest, whoever, won't make a dot of difference. Business is where this gets driven from. Business is driven by policies. And when I started to look really hard at our own business, I thought quickly there are solutions. Some are harder than others. We're going to have to drive down the cost of those solutions. Go to your point about not being in any way inflationary. Um, you know, it's hard, but it's very possible, if not highly probable. And the difference is leadership, just courage and leadership. So I'm pushing my fellow captains of industry now, saying if that permafrost lets go, your business is toast. Let's just look at it for what it is. And so we now have to switch off our fossil fuels and we have to do it by as close as we can to 2030. No, thank you. And I really appreciate your call for leadership also. We know that uh, as university institutions of the world, we actually educate, we give degrees to about 70, 70 million students every year. So what we bring into the classrooms in terms of Terrible. the kind of leadership you are calling for yeah. matters. It does. So I think that is, uh, that is something that we, we yeah. will, we're definitely are working with also at the Smith That's School and at Oxford yeah. in general. Yes, thank you. We have another question here, please. Yeah, thanks so much, Andrew. I'm, my name is Claire Molinari. I'm head of ESG at Care Super, actually one of your investors. I did do uh, my DPhil here at, at Oxford um, some time ago. Um, but I just had a question about your, some of your new energy businesses and the perception that's in the market that there'll actually be a bit of a drag on returns. Um, what, what do you think are the investments that will change people's minds and show that this, this is a really valuable way, place to invest? Okay, so um, it's a really good question. In the conversations I've had with our colleagues at BHP and Rio, they have remarked that our share price um, is outperforming theirs. Um, and that our number of shareholders has gone from, from 50,000 shareholders to 180,000 shareholders over the period that we've been prosecuting turning our company green and producing green hydrogen to allow the rest of the world to finish that race to also go green. A lot of that race is green electricity, but not all of it. And there's a huge part, 30 to 40%, which must literally be mobile energy like oil and gas and coal. That's going to be hydrogen or hydrogen derivatives. So at the outset, I'd say, well, is total shareholder return the fundamental here? And if the answer is yes, then what we're doing is already proven right because of our outperformance. But second, I'd say, um, and it's a, that, that equation I began to get to, and then someone flashed up, you've got five minutes left, so I cut it off. Um, uh, that equation I got to the 6.2 billion. We've already saved nearly $500 million um, out of that 6.2 billion since we started putting in solar and everything uh, to push ourselves off gas and oil and diesel. And we'll spend that 6.2 billion US um, by about 27, 28. Like it's, it, we're spending it now. Now we will save out of that um, from switching off a billion litres of diesel a year, will save at least a billion US dollars. Over that construction and implementation period, our total savings will grow from 400 million to 3 billion. 
So our net investment, net net investment, is 3.2 billion once you've taken off the savings. Now you've got a billion dollars a year being saved forever against a net investment of 3.2. That's a 33% rate of return. That is many times Warren Buffett's miracle of 9%. So I'm saying this is a good investment. Don't think you can't do it. If a mining industry can, then every industry can. Thank you very much for this. Uh, I have a question here, but uh, before I take that, I would, I would love to also challenge you a little bit on the thousand people that you mentioned a few times here. So uh, you sort of kept returning to, you know, we need to mobilize those individuals because they can actually make a big difference for changing the world. So how do, how do we mobilize them to do exactly what? Okay, so it's, um, it's, it's the same way that I got yeah. mobilized. Yeah. You know, I listened to people listening fortunately is involuntary um, and um, and you know I certainly listened to people I read what was being sent to me I, obviously not everyone's going to go into a PhD but um, but you could hear clearly what informed opinion was and if they're challenging how you operate and you challenge how they got to their reasoning and you found their reasoning to be uh, good to be pure, then you felt real pressure to change, and it's that pressure to change. It's not using guilt, but shame. Mm -hmm. If you don't change, is the fundamental here. And I think students here, researchers here, professors here, um, do have a big role in public opinion in Britain, and Britain has a big role in public opinion in the world. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's how I believe it can start. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for this. We have a question here and then a final question here and then we will close off. Please. Thank you very much, Dr. Forrest. Uh, Brian O'Callaghan, a leader program here at the Smith School. Um, we've seen several new major green pieces of legislation over the last couple of years, in particular the Inflation Reduction Act. When you look at the tax credit-based investment incentives for green hydrogen there, do you see that as being A, positive, B, sufficient, and C, an example for the rest of the world to look to? Yeah, look, I absolutely do. And, uh, and I've had it out with your government here, saying it is, it is moronic and displays intense lack of economic understanding. You know, you should be teaching your politicians with your articulate understanding of economics that if you put a multiplier into the system, an economic multiplier, an investment multiplier, then you will keep on growing. And my role with the IRA was to persuade the White House to take off the cap. To, if, if, it's, if it's an investment which looks like repaying itself every three to five years, and by the way, it looks like it's gonna do that quicker because it's sucking an investment from all over the world, including from us, then you have an economic multiplier in your system and you should not cut it off. You should not run the gauntlet with Congress again. If it's repaying itself every three to five years, just keep it going, 350 billion, half a trillion, one trillion, just keep it going because it's great for your economy um, and it's also great for the world. And countries like Britain have said, yeah, but it's sucking uh, investment dollars. You, Forrest, could put more capital into Britain and now you're gonna put it in North America. And I say, exactly right, but it's not a zero sum game. You know, it's not as though I have $2 to put into a good investment and that's it. No, if I have a good investment, I can find another $2 and I can find another $2 and another $2. It can accelerate. The lack of understanding of the power of the IRA to actually help a country's economy is mind-boggling, um, but I'll keep hammering it saying, countries should put in IRAs if you want to increase your standard of living and, and have higher education levels and higher standard of livings, Put in an in IRA on, by the way, you might help global warming too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please, final question. Hi, uh, my name is George Curry Jones. I'm a researcher in the Smith School as well. Um, so, if you want to hit this 2030 goal, as you say, you think about 2030, not 2040, each election cycle is particularly important. And I know that we saw it in Australia last year. We've got obviously a very important election coming up in the UK next year. 
these like sensitive intervention points to change the narrative of green transitions, um, both within the public and also in the political class. So I wanted to say firstly a massive thank you to you for the intervention you made a couple of weeks ago, pushing back against the conservative policies that are putting in place. Do you have a kind of equal message of action for the UK Labour Party and what they can be doing, or what you think they should be doing over the next 18 months to put themselves in the right footing for uh, kind of meeting all of these points that you've made here today? Yeah, I do. Um, the, the highest growth total shareholder return company in Australia's history over the last quarter of a century is Fortescue Middles Group. Okay, um, and, uh, and it's not by 10 or 20%, it's like two or 300%. That is because we made investments into areas which really needed investment. There is no area more obvious, nor critical, but more obvious than investing in green energy. Yes, humans are gonna do what humans do and they're gonna drag themselves along slowly and watch other people move. But when public opinion at that level finally changes, there'll be a stampede, a really big stampede. Get in in front of that. You know, if you really care for the British economy, if you want to up the education levels, if you want to up the standard of living, if you want to create what Boris Johnson used to whinge to me about is, how do I reverse the British brain drain? I said, well, stop being a fossil and promoting fossil fuel, Boris. You know, talk green. Invest green, you'll get all the great British minds coming back home quick sticks. Right? It will drive your economy hard. You know, and you might say, well, we've only got wind in the North Sea or we've only got this. That Actually, you've got some of the best universities, some of the best think tanks. You know, we're developing some of the best technologies within half an hour's drive from here. Right? So you've got what it takes. Encourage it. Get your economy cranked up. Bring your greatest minds home, grow your greatest minds right here, and go green. And look, I've got economic fundamentals on my side. It's, once again, it's like maths, I can prove this. Thank you very much for this inspiring. Can I, can I just ask a last question to you? So you were mentioning COP, the COP coming up here in, uh, in a few weeks time. COP. What is your, yeah, the COP28. What is your biggest hope for that particular event uh, this year? Um, that we as a global population understand how difficult it is to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies. It sounds trite to say, eliminate fossil fuel subsidies <laughs> now, but say if you're in Argentina um, and you have a power price which is pushed down by, fo by fossil fuel subsidies, mm -hmm. Yet most of your wealthier um, compatriots in your country will leave the air conditioning on when they leave for the office, just so it's cool when they come back in, and waste all that energy all day, um, then you'll realise, well, if we take that away, then the energy price will rise, and the masses who actually employ very little energy, as opposed to those who employ a lot, they're the ones who are going to suffer and vote you out. So I would say the primary message of COP is to go and educate your public. Like if those millions and millions of Argentinians knew that they can't send their kids to school because they're getting a lower energy price and their economy's stuffed because of it, because they're subsidising every rare cent they have, then they'd say, hey, oh God, I didn't know that. Okay, well, thank you for that leadership. Thank you for telling your people this is why fossil fuel subsidies are so bad. I will hope that what comes out of COP28 is a realistic ambition, that those who leave it and those who attend it go back to their countries and say, the reason why we have to get rid of fossil fuel subsidies right now isn't just because your planet's gonna cook, it is because we're destroying your economy. And we're sucking $7 trillion a year out of it. I know that's a huge number, but it hits every single country. It hits Australia, it hits Argentina, it hits Britain. You know, go back home with the guts to tell your shareholders and to tell your electorate, this is why fossil fuel subsidies must come to an end in the next few years. And by the way, your energy consumption 
is not a multiplying game. You will, you will use $2 of energy, whether it's fossil fuel or green. Just switch, switch and explain to your electorate, explain to your shareholders what we've done to our shareholders, why we're going green. It's going to be challenging and we're going to get a lot of criticism, we're going to be arguing economics, but when we're fully green, we'll have the lowest cost of power and you shareholders will have the highest margin of profit. And that's what I will be asking leaders across the world at COP28. Go home and explain why fossil fuels must come to an end, subsidies must come to an end straight away. On that beautiful note, uh, I want to say thank you so much, Andrew, for an amazing speak, for bringing by your personal example uh, and all your achievements to show us that it can be done and also for bringing your personal energy uh, to the room here uh, to inspire all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you.